Um, okay, so um, uh, it's very nice to uh, have this opportunity for uh, for uh, for us to hear uh, Professor Rems. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Rems actually um, graduated uh, from the medical school of Albert Ludwig's University uh, of Frisberg. That's a little easy to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, she got an MD there, and then uh, she served as a physician for uh, 50 years uh, since uh, 1970 in the University of Kiel. Um, and then uh, she became a professor of uh, cardiac oncology in the University of Essen. And after that, uh, in the middle, she did sabbatical in uh, uh, England, um, and then uh, she went to her current uh, place in 1997. Okay, in the uh, as a professor of uh, pharmacology and toxicology in Technical University of Dresden in Germany, and she served as a chair of that department until two years ago. So now she's uh, uh, the professor here. Uh, professor Renz has published more than 250 uh, papers uh, in um, cardiac uh, pharmacology and electrophysiology. And she has received the numerous awards. I'm not going to go through all the things because there's a very nice profile <coughs> on her and her research group published in circulation in 2010 about you know all her accomplishments and if you're interested you should go look, pick up this paper and, uh, and uh, read it it's very interesting one of the things that I was actually pleasantly surprised that she even recognized several Chinese characters when she visited me and it turns out that actually she was uh, she spent like three years in Hong Kong and uh, get some education in Hong Kong so here, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your very kind <laughs> introduction. And uh, well, I must admit, I've been very fond of everything Chinese ever since I was a small child, because my father had already been to China before the Second World War. And when I was a child, he always told me many stories about China. But I must go on with this and not uh, become <coughs> Too much uh, storytelling. I'm very, very happy to be here, and uh, I'm very sorry that Joram can't be here because I've known Joram for a long time, and it's really great to be here and experience all the hospitality in your wonderful campus. We could, I could really envy you for such a wonderful surrounding. I'm a little bit nervous, I must admit, because I've seen so much highbrow science today that I hope I'm not too simple for you. Anyway, when I was in medical school, atrial fibrillation was thought to be something not so very important. We were all scared about ventricular fibrillation because, you know, that is not compatible with life for a long time. But atrial fibrillation, we thought, well, don't worry about, you can fare well with this. Today, we have a different approach because the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is so much higher than it used to be because people get much older. And we are afraid of the stroke, the risk of stroke it may cause, and we are trying very hard to find cures for atrial fibrillation. The surgeons amongst you will know that ablation is one of the best things to do, but the pharmacologists, which I became, think that maybe drugs can do something for it. And in recent years, we've had the idea of atrial selective uh, drugs. And I would like to, I've done a bit of research on this, so I would like to talk to you about this. These are my um, conflicts of interest, which I would like to declare. Some of the drugs I'm talking about, I have collaborated with these companies on. So I would like to tell you a little bit about my simple views of uh, antiarrhythmic and proarrhythmic drug effects and then I will go on and uh, I don't know whether I can go through all five, four points but if time permits I will 
this is what my I would like to attempt. I never know how fast I can speak before when I prepare a talk. So let's get started. Now there are a lot of antirhythmic drugs available in the market. I've placed here a few of the older ones like quinidine, which is still used in Europe. I don't know whether you still use it in the US. Dazepiridine or plecanide. And they are in fact effective in converting uh, atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm, although not, not very much. The placebo effect is uh, very big as well. But it, this is done at the cost of an increase in mortality. So this naturally is something which is not uh, the thing we want to do to our patients. And the reason why the increase in mortality is there is that I think all antiarrhythmic drugs also have proarrhythmic effects. So if we go to a very old uh, um, categorization of antiarrhythmic drugs by Vaughan Williams, we have the class one drugs that reduce sodium currents or block sodium channels. And this will have uh, two uh, several good effects like reduction of excitability, increase of post-excitatory refractoriness, and it will reduce the incidences of uh, exosystoles by increasing, uh, decreasing excitability. At the same time, it will slow down, slow down conduction velocity and thereby uh, foster re-entry, promote re-entry. So if we look at this in a simple scheme here, this would be a re-entry circuit, which can be described by the wavelength and the effective refractory period times conduction velocity. And you know uh, all this when the wavelength is decreased, more of these re-entry cycles will fit into a certain piece of tissue. We can also look at this from uh, rotor's uh, point of view. I don't want to go into this discussion right now. And uh, I know that you have a lot of experience with all this here. The proarrhythmic effect of the antiarrhythmic sodium channel blockers is uh, promoting re-entry. If we take the action potential duration, which is mainly controlled by the activity of the potassium channels and can be prolonged when the potassium uh, currents are blocked, then this will increase the effective refractory period. And in the previous slide, I showed you that this could stop re-entry. So that is a very accurate effect. But it is bought in at the expense of producing the risk of torsal defiance and particular fibrillation. So if we block these potassium currents here, we get a longer action potential duration. And this may promote reactivation of calcium channels or even sodium channels. And then by uh, activating the sodium calcium exchange in the reverse mode, we can get these tar early after depolarization that may deteriorate into uh, ventricular fibrillation. So both recognized antiarrhythmic principles like slowing down of uh, uh, blocking of sodium channels with reduction of excitability and prolongation of the effective refractory period uh, can have proarrhythmic effects. So this is why we thought it might be a good idea to have atrial selective compounds that will only affect ion channels in the atria or will only pr affect processes in the atria and leave the ventricles unaffected because this is what we fear. With atrial fibrillation, we can survive, and we do not want to stop atrial fibrillation at the cost of producing ventricular fibrillation. So let's go now to putative atrial selective drugs which target various, can target various ion channels. Now, sodium channels have um, reach or gain a lot of attention in the scientific community. Uh, although there, there are some differences in the sodium channel properties between atria and ventricles. Now here you see an action potential 
from a typical atrial action potential and typical ventricular action potential. The sodium channels have different properties. In atria, they have a larger current density than in ventricle, and if the peak, the activation peaks at the slightly more positive uh, potential. But one of the major differences between atria and ven ventricle is that the atria have a more depolarizing, uh, depolarized resting membrane potential than the ventricles. And this will lead to, if you look now here at the inactivation curves, because of the more, uh, the more negative uh, resting memory potential in the ventricle, you will have more sodium channels in the, act in the um, uh, activitable, no, that's not the right word, in the available state in the ventricle than in the atria. And if we now have a compound which will bind more to the inactivated state, more atrial sodium channels will be affected by this compound, and this would reduce atrial selectivity. We could also imagine compounds like uh, this one here, vanacalat, which do have a different affinity to the sodium channel depending on the membrane potential. And this is, in fact, the case with vanacalat. The IC50 at minus 60 millivolt is roughly about um, a factor of three more um, lower, that means the channel is more sensitive, at minus 60 to this compound than at uh, minus 120. And that would be that we would have some selectivity for atria because they have a more depolarized uh, resting membrane potential. There is, in fact, a strong frequency-dependent effect of sodium channel block with vanacalat, as shown here for human atrial cells from sinus rhythm patients. This is, these are the sodium currents um, at uh, 0.5 hertz, and here are sodium currents at 3 hertz. And when we add vanacalant, we have hardly any effect at uh, 0.5 hertz, but what we change to 6 hertz, of course there is some decline because of uh, less recovery from inactivation, also under control conditions, but you can see there is a strong effect of vanacalant at the high frequency. If we take a larger concentration, like 30 micromolar, hardly any effect here, and a larger effect at the higher frequency. So we have a strong frequency dependent effect, which can also be shown at the multicellular tissue level. Here you can see typical action potentials. Black are the controls at 1 hertz, and here at 3 hertz from a sinus rhythm with a typical uh, patient with a typical spike and dome configuration, and in atrial fibrillation with a triangular um, shape here. When I say atrial fibrillation, we, I mean this is tissue from patients who were in chronic atrial fibrillation. That means they have had at least two documented periods of atrial fibrillation within the last six months uh, prior to cardiac surgery because all these preparations were of course taken from patients undergoing cardiac surgery for various reasons. Now, what about the frequency dependence here in this situation? When we change the frequency in a stepwise manner, the maximum upstroke velocity decreases here, and this preparation followed until the frequency of 5 hertz. When we add vanacalant, it will not follow 5 hertz any longer at 1 micromolar, and the preparation fails to follow stimulation at uh, with 30 micromolar already at the frequency of 3 hertz. And something similar can be seen here. You see that at the higher frequencies, the effect, the reduction of the VDT max is clearly larger. <coughs> so Vanacalant, as you may know, has made it to the market. And Vanacalant is shown here to convert the patients uh, from atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm after intravenous application. 
and after 90 minutes, about roughly half of the patients are converted. It doesn't say anything about how long they stay converted, but at least here they are converted, and this was the reason why Vanakalant was approved for intravenous conversion in Europe in 2010. I'm not so sure what the situation is here in the United States. I know that there were lots of requests for additional studies by the FDA. Is it approved here as well? So in Europe it is. So this principle of frequency dependent uh, sodium channel block is, uh, has been established and has been approved as a drug on the market in Europe. Now, recently, there has been a lot of talk about a special form of sodium uh, uh, channel function, that is the late sodium current. That means that sodium current does not inactivate completely, but uh, some sodium channels remain open as long as you depolarize uh, uh, membrane. And I have been interested in this um, late sodium current for a long time. This was actually uh, the first paper after I had been introduced to the voltage clamp technique by Garrett Eisenberg. Some of you may even have uh, met in the past. And this is an experiment from guinea pig ventricular cardiomyocytes where we induced a very slowly inactivating sodium current. We don't see the peak current because it's just such a slow time scale by a sea anemone toxin called ATX2. And when you do this in the current clamp mode, you can see that this late sodium current produces a lot of these early after depolarizations and even delayed after depolarizations. Now, this is a very uh, early work of mine and I forgot about all these late sodium currents, but recently this has become a big issue again because Several uh, groups have shown that in the dog and the human failing heart, there is definitely a sodium, a late sodium current, current flow through non-inactivated sodium channels. But please uh, uh, have a look, if we go back here, if you look at the scale, this is one nanoamp, and if we go to uh, the, the ventricular tissue, this is less than 100 picoamps, so it's a much, much smaller current we have here. And very recently, there have also been some uh, reports about late sodium current playing a role in remodeling during atrial fibrillation. This work here from Lars Meyer's group in Göttingen in Germany by Susala shows uh, some sodium currents, which I, I'm not so interested in at the moment, but here you see the late sodium current that is observed in uh, cardiomyocytes from AF patients. And they went on to say that there are a few drugs that selectively block this late sodium current. And this got me on the scene. I was very interested in this late sodium current here. And we tried to measure it in human cells. And the way we measured it was we used a special clamp protocol. We held the cells at minus 80 millivolt, then we had a quick step to 100 millisecond step to minus 110 millivolt, and then stepped to the maximum activation potential minus 30 uh, millivolt to activate sodium and to find out whether there was any uh, late sodium current here. And we argued that if we take the current flow at minus 80 and at minus 110 and extrapolate it to minus 30, then if there is late sodium current, it must be observable as a deviation from the straight line of the conductance here. So this was our idea. This is just a hypothetical uh, curve. And these are the data from quite a number of uh, cells from a fairly huge number of patients where we could never see any deviation from the straight line. So we did a few other experiments and we submitted this and then it came back with uh, yes, 
very nice. You don't see the same sort of hand, but if you want to be really sure, you must make further experiments. First of all, you have to show that your uh, method is sensitive enough to pick up such a small current, and actually you should add TTX to see that you're really in uh, dealing with sodium channels. So we did. First, we got hold of uh, mice strain with a mutation in uh, the sodium channel, which leads to some uh, delayed inactivation and some TTX sensitive late sodium current. You can see this here. This is our protocol again. And you can see that the, in the uh, delta K mice with a sodium channel mutation, there is some larger current in the absence than in the presence of TTX. Gray is with TTX. And we also did another protocol which was used by Sosala because the regulars asked us to. They help the cells at minus 120 millivolts to have more of uh, the ion channels in the available state. And uh, well, we didn't use this protocol in the beginning because not many human cells uh, survive it. They don't like the strong hyperpolarization as a holding uh, um, uh, potential. So uh, that's why we choose this one because we thought it was more physiological. But then we tried very hard and also used the Susala protocol. And another thing is what they do is they first depolarize to plus 50 to get close to the reversal potential and so that they will get a better voltage control and no voltage escape, but then they step back to minus 30 like we did and they measure current here in the end of the impulse. When you do this protocol, the TTX sensitive late current in this mice strain is much larger, but that's natural because we have more channels available at this very negative holding <coughs> now we did an, another step. We said after TTX, since these, the TTX sensitive current is so small, we want to be sure that there is no uh, shift, no drift in our uh, tracing. So we excluded all cells where we had more than 10 picogram uh, uh, change in the presence of TTX at minus 80 millivolt. And then we went with this showing that we can actually measure late current back to our human cells. And these are the results. Here you see the control tracing from a sinus rhythm a patient in uh, black and in gray it's in the presence of TTX. You don't see very much here in sinus rhythm under control conditions and TTX. And in AF you do see a TTX sensitive uh, current. These are the mean data. On average, this became significant, and we have, this is the control, this is in the presence of TTX, the control in AF, and in the presence of TTX. So when we measure the TTX sensitive current only, we get a clearly significant difference between atrial fibrillation and sinus rhythm. The currents are larger with the second protocol for the reasons I out outlined previously. Here we analyzed the data after 50 milliseconds of the impulse, but we got a very similar result when we analyzed it later after 250 milliseconds. The only difference between the results with 50 milliseconds was that we get sli got slightly smaller current, indicating that there was still some current decline within the course of this uh, uh, process. So, oops, now I went back. Sorry. What am I doing? So here is the uh, uh, the data. We also tested ranolazine, and with ranolazine, we only uh, studied the protocol with a minus 80 millivolt holding potential. But what you can see again is that there was clearly a significant ranolazine sensitive current when analyzed at 50 milliseconds and after 250 milliseconds. So this actually says ranolazine also in human cardiomyocytes in uh, um, 
atrial cardiomyocytes from patients with AF blocks a late sodium cream. Then we had a look at action potentials and the effect of ranolazine on the action potential. And what we saw was, as you would expect from a drug that blocks late sodium current, which would be effective here in the plateau range, some depression of the plateau phase or some shortening of the plateau phase. And also we saw some prolongation of the late phases of the action potential. Now we were a bit puzzled about this, but then we uh, uh, found in the literature that ranolazine is known to be a blocker of potassium currents, IKR current uh, to be specific. And uh, then we were not so worried about this. And we compared the concentration necessary for blocking the plateau phase and for reducing the BDT max. And we found that only very high concentrations are necessary and can do this, 30 micromolar. That is a concentration where also the peak sodium current will be blocked. Now we know that ranolazine in clinical studies is effective in uh, converting atrial fibrillation into sinothrilum. We also know that it never produces a prolongation of the um, uh, um, QRS complex. That means it doesn't have a lot of uh, effect on conduction. Uh, so uh, it may be that the ranolazine is effective not so much because of the sodium channel block, but because of its metabolic effect. And after all, it was um, developed as an uh, angular drug against uh, uh, metabolic effects. So when we come to the conclusion, I must put a question mark here, whether selective late sodium current block would be an atrial uh, selective um, drug effect or drug target. So let's go to the next one, to the potassium channel. Yes, please. So the, I mean, all physicists, so the, the uh, the change of the current is a really small. Yes. Uh, and also the change in action potential is not very big. So is there any like modeling or calculation to show that that those two two are related or I mean the, the effect they are expected? Yes. This is a very good question. We have attempted this with uh, uh, modeling uh, by from uh, Norway, one of her students did some modeling for us, but we had a big uh, problem with the modeling because they always model a cellular action potential from a single cell. And that looks uh, quite different from the ones we find in sinus rhythm. For example, in the multicellular tissue, we find a very distinct um, this uh, very distinct spike and dome phase. When you look at the action potential in the single cell, you find something which comes down here and fades off or tails off. It looks completely different. You lack this distinct plateau phase. And you can model uh, some even further reduction and uh, we also put in the IKR block here and the late prolongation in the sing uh, single cell um, action potential, even with very, very small current changes to the late sorry, uh, current, but it did not look like these action potentials here and we did not measure any cellular action potentials in this case. So we tried this uh, modeling, but because it didn't really fit, I didn't put it in. But it's, uh, you put your point exactly where there was a little weakness. So now we come to one of the potassium channels, the uh, <coughs> IKUR current, the KV1.5. And this is uh, quite, an, quite like the, the KV1.5 data for several reasons. First reason is mm -hmm. the principle behind it is uh, KV1.5 is 
functionally expressed only in the atria. So we, when we block it, we will only get the prolongation in the atria and thereby